As the Regional Director of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, I want to welcome you very much to today's Gender Forum on the theme, the post-2015 development agenda, paying a particular focus on the actualization of women's human rights in this debate. The Gender Forum, as many of you know, is a monthly event that the Heinrich Böll Foundation has been organizing for over 10 years now. And seeing so many of you in the room, your presence, your participation tells us this forum is as relevant as it always has been. And it is a platform that we are providing every last Thursday of the month in order to look at pertinent, important issues through a gender lens. The development goals have been set for 2015. And the discussions and the debates to what will happen past it has been actually going on for a while. So the question stands, why do we have an urgency to put this forum here together today? As you will hear from our panelists in a little bit, many steps have been taken in Kenya to do two things. To first of all look at how recommendations from Kenya can be given to an international process and also at the same time to develop priorities for Kenya and set national targets in defining de the de local development agenda. Kenya is also, as far as I believe, um, a co-chair to the Open Working Group that is tasked to develop the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, which will be building on the Millennium Development Goals. And you will be hearing more of this process later from the panel. Both of these processes will somehow converge into the post-2015 development agenda and many of us, including me, are actually not very clear how this will be happening and I hope we'll be enlightened a little on some of these questions. But having said this, I wonder how many of you are actually knowledgeable of this and knowing that this is going on already since past, then since last year and that Kenya is playing actually a very important role in all of this. And at least for me, a lot of this was new. Um, that was our initial intention to bring this forum here today and make sure that this is shared with the public. Because one of the principles of this entire process to arrive at that post-2015 framework, you will hear that a lot today, is inclusivity. It's the participation of a wide range of stakeholders, including, of course, civil society and the public. And then there's a lot of information that needs to be shared around it and that is not yet in the public and I hope that we can contribute to this today. For those of you that know us not so well, I don't think very many, um, but of those that don't know the Heinrich Perl Foundation, we are a German Green Foundation. Um, we have been a very strong promoter for equal rights and equal opportunities gender policy and for since the inception of the foundation. By now we have increasingly grown hesitant to actually use the word sustainable because to a large degree it has become stripped of its content. Um, but how many really remember what that initially very 
um, very radical principles still contains. That also unfortunately became obvious in the last Rio Plus 20 conference, where I believe many came back rather disillusioned in terms of the progress that were, uh, was made. And when we look back 20 years, it is indeed not really painting a very rosy picture. There has been economic growth, no doubt, but the gains from it have been very unequal. The gap between the rich and the poor is widening. There are one and a half billion people that live in extreme poverty and women make up two thirds of them. Particularly affected by poverty are rural women and girls because overall, globally, they own about 20% of the land. And in some places, in some countries, it's as little as 5%. And I just want to throw these figures here to say how important it is that we ensure that women's rights are a central element of the discussions to developing a post-2015 development framework. So coming back from Rio, to find out where is the debate on gender equality overall, we commissioned a paper that you were all handed as you were coming in, and it provides an excellent overview, I believe, of many of the parallel and sometimes, I think, also confusing processes that are going on to arrive at this development agenda. And it looks at the various positions women organizations, gender act activists are taking in the debate. It also spells out some very principled, very basic principles that have been formulated around how we should be looking at the gender equality agenda in developing the development agenda. And these are very, very clear, very simple principles as advancing equality and equity, a principle that says nothing about us without us, meaning women have to play a, an important role they have, there has to be real participation. Of course, questions around accountability, transparency, very concrete measures to actually monitor achievements, the visibility of human rights and universality, which means gender inequality is universally relevant. It's not restricted to certain thematic or even geographic places. So looking at some of these principles that you can also find here, they are directly answering to a lot of the criticism that has been raised around the Millennium Development Goals. And we will be hearing much more from the panel on this. One of the key criticisms is that there was largely a normative framework absent in developing those goals. And some, some key questions, issues that were even raised in the Millennium Declaration, like for example, peace and human rights, did not even translate into the MDGs. Also, as you could see in the MDGs, there was a single goal that was speaking about the question of equality and women's empowerment. And the result of this was that efforts and reporting very much centered around goal three, that was the gender women's rights goal, and other goals that were relating to poverty, eradication, to questions of health, sustainability, and so on, were often approached pretty gender blind. And in a way that has exacerbated, of course, gender justice, because if you do not start with a gendered approach, then of course the results, results will not yield achievement of such. But I also want to give you another example. We have actually just had a, a small conversation about it, and I know Paul will come back to the question. Um, what are examples where MDGs have actually been achieved? And one of them, for example, is Brazil. Brazil has been very successful um, in, its, in its policies, mainly redistribution policies, achieving the Millennium Development Goals. It's right on track. It has lifted a lot of people out of poverty. But the social distribution that has been going on in Brazil has been very much based on an extractive approach. It has used and exploited its natural resources. So the economic model that it's based on has led to issues in other fields, for example, depletion of land. Um, it has 
also violated human rights in many ways. It has exploited people. And women have often borne the, the main impact of it. So we have seen improvements on the one hand with regards to development and poverty reduction, but we're seeing that this is coming at a cost. So there's a question now, and women's organizations around the globe have been asking this and have said, do we want to see more of the same? Or is there a need to actually have a different understanding of development? And there is a general strong argument to look of more radical structural transformations that also look into priorities and realities of women, or particularly look into the realities and priorities of women. And um, those that have followed it have even seen that there's been a call saying, we do not want to be, we will not be mainstreamed into an already polluted stream. So the question is, when we look at the next global development agenda, what is the normative framework for it? There's a strong argument to say it needs to be rooted in existing human rights frameworks and architecture that's already there, particularly looking into women's rights. But there might also be a need to really go beyond just the question of gender mainstreaming and so on and focus more on governance and policy reforms and even looking into a macroeconomic policy reform level. And with this, I want to hand over to Paul. He's the head of the Secretariat of the African Civil Society Platform. Is that correct? And I think I'll leave it up to you to say a few more words about yourself. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Katrin. And uh, I'm, really, I'm really glad that uh, at least in a session about gender, you know, every time you talk about gender, everybody tells you that gender is about men and women. Uh, but when you begin the conversation, it immediately begins about women. Uh, so it's glad that at least we have got uh, three men uh, who, are coming to, who are coming to join us. And for that, we sincerely appreciate. That's a very good change. And very, very welcome. A very good welcome to uh, all of you, each and every one uh, of you who has ac accepted to join us. Uh, I don't know how many of you may remember, but around the 23rd of April, uh, the UN decided to begin the countdown of 1,000 days uh, to the MDGs. And part of that, uh, part of, part of that countdown will be in September, uh, to be precise, on the 26th of September. I hope I get that, that date right. When the, U, uh, when the UN Secretary General is going to present his report on where the process is with, with about, I think by that time there will be about 70 or so days, uh, or over 700 or so days left not 700, probably about nine, 850 or so days left. So it's very good for us sitting right now to do that kind of analysis and see where we are and see where we, uh, and see what, uh, what we have left. And we have got a very, very exciting panel uh, today that is going to share with us. And sometimes we'll also be having somebody who will tell us something as what is going on in Kenya, what's happening at the, at the community level, what, is, what has happened so far, where do we stand and where are we headed. One of the things you're going to hear about the MDG process and what is happening is that it's fairly a complex process in terms of how we uh, bring about development. And so I know some of us may find that a little bit, a little bit challenging in why we need all these all this, all this complexities. But I think the important thing, and maybe one, one more fundamental thing that, uh, that underlies all those complexity, is to understand the response that was made to one of the reports that was developed, uh, specifically by another, another UN team set up, set up by the Secretary General called the Sustainable Development Goals uh, solutions network. So when you are talking all about power, then unless you deal with this whatever from that perspective, uh, from, from that perspective, you can do all the things and write all the reports and make all the goals. But you'll discover that un unless you change the power games and unless unless you change the positions of power, you really cannot bring development. 
And so when you listen to all these processes, and uh, allow me to just quickly take you through the process which are going on. There is uh, the very first one that all of us probably know is the Millennium, Millennium uh, Declaration, which everybody believes was a fairly good looking, looking uh, of a proposal by the United Nations in how to bring in all those issues of gender but in development. Then after that, we know that the Millennium Declaration was turned into some eight MDGs, which is the context of our discussion today. There have been reviews every single year. There are two more reviews left. One is this year, and then the last one will be next year. Uh, Kenya has just completed its own status report uh, last month, and we'll be hearing a bit about that. And then last year, the United Nations came together, or the umbrella agency, and they formed a team called the UN Task Team. And so the very first report that came out in terms of looking at the MDGs but also looking at the way forward was the UN Task Team report and you can get that uh, on the website of the, of the United Nations. Thereafter, there has been the high level panel uh, that you, you've, you've heard so much about. There has been the uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Uh, the report I think came, came out about three weeks ago. There is the Global Conversations, which was a conversation with civil society all over the world. Uh, which was uh, done by the, by the United Nations. Again, that report is out and you can look at it. Last week, the Global Compact, which is typically looking at it from a business perspective, released uh, its report. And that report, again, uh, is available. You can, uh, you can look at it. Now, that's the UN processes that is going on today. Now, from the government perspective, a group was formed uh, that is called the Open Working Group that you had uh, Katrin speak about. And Dina will be telling us a little bit about what is happening there. And then there is the UN High Level Political Forum. Uh, which again is looking at that process and again will also present its own report sometime in September. Uh, the business, I don't know how many business people are here, but from the business perspective also, for the very first time, uh, the business have been very engaged in looking at the development moving forward. So there is a group called Business Fights Poverty, which again has been working on the report, there is, and then there is the World Economic Forum, uh, which has also been having all those consultations. So it may be good as we listen to what is happening that we are also aware that uh, it is part of that larger context. And so to very quickly open for us is Dina Musinde um, Rezo, who is the executive director of FEMNET. Uh, she's just fresh from New York, I think yesterday. And she'll, she'll give us a brief overview of what is happening uh, in the global perspective and also what the civil society uh, has done. So allow me to welcome, I'll be introducing them one by one as they, as, uh, as, as they speak. So allow me to introduce the first speaker, uh, Dina. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a great opportunity to, to be able to speak with you, or discuss with you about uh, post-2015 development framework. From, so I'll be talking mainly about the global perspective as far as the post-2015 uh, development agenda is concerned, but also at the African uh, region, uh, because most of us are from Africa. So what, what are we thinking as, as a region? So at the global level, um, apart from the high level plan that was formed that Koja spoke about, there were also uh, different thematic areas, and there were nine of them. One was in inequalities which was all issues, uh, including gender. So you can imagine anything to do with inequality was ramped in one thematic area, which was called in, uh, inequalities. Uh, then there was one uh, on health, education, growth and employment, uh, conflict and fragility, uh, and population dynamic. Yeah, so um, at the level of the thematic areas, Feminet has also been engaged in terms of uh, trying to participate in the discussions, because different discussions happened, uh, consultations in different countries. For example, we participated in the governance consultation that took place in, in, in South Africa. And so, again, it was to ensure that uh, women voices are heard. Um, uh, and also, there were a lot of online discussions that were launched to discuss in different thematic areas. And so, we, we really tried to contribute, especially to the thematic areas on inequalities, to ensure that the gender issues under inequalities are actually uh, coming out, uh, but also from the Africa perspective. Uh, so when it comes to the high-level panel of eminent people that the Secretary General of the UN uh, put together, um, 
as Paul said, they were not just many women in that in, the, in that in that high level panel, but one of the co-chairs was a woman. Among so many presidents that we have in, in Africa that are men, the only two women, one was chosen to actually be uh, the co one of the co-chairs and the only one from Africa, and that was the president of Liberia, President Salif Johnson. And so we found it strategic to engage with her and give her our message. And she was very receptive. She really wanted to hear what we have to say. And she felt that she's representing our voices, which we appreciated. And we offered ourselves to, you know, to give her all the much information as possible. And so, uh, so Feminet working as a part of the civil society group that has been engaging in this process, in fact, set up a secretariat mainly to support Salif uh, Johnson uh, in, in, in her role as co-chair of the high-level uh, panel of the eminent people. So that's one of the things that we have been uh, trying to do. Um, but also, apart from being part of the wide civil society uh, group or uh, Africa civil society group, also FEMNET formed an ad hoc committee of African women's rights organizations. And this included, it included FEMNET, it included um, Akinamama wa Africa, Iyasi, uh, Award, World Earth, uh, Oxfam, IPPF. And really the purpose of this was to ensure that how do we make sure that we mobilize African women to bring out issues that are affecting them so that they're not left out when we talk about post-20 development framework. So in that regard, during that time, we held uh, a, consult a physical consultative meeting because a lot of ongoing consultations have been going on, but many times we all know that it's important to meet physically and discuss face to face. So we were able to bring together women from different sub-regions of Africa, uh, women from the, grassroots, from the grassroots, young women, women working on uh, the elder issues, women working on different thematic areas. And the purpose of this meeting really was to ensure that different things affecting women in different areas, uh, under different thematic areas are not left out. And this was really a group of really good uh, experts in their own areas. And so we used that consultation to actually come up with a paper which we called Mind the Gap. And this paper really was articulating uh, what has not gone so well with MDGs as far as gender equality is concerned. Uh, what is it that we want to see in post-2015 as women in the, in the gender perspective? And one of the things we advocated for uh, that also in that paper is a standalone goal on gender equality because we felt that it's very important. We are still struggling with issues of gender equality. So if we just leave it to mainstreaming, we might not see uh, enough of it. And then the other issue that we advocated for also is to mainstream or integrate gender in all the, the, the whole framework. And at that time, we didn't even know uh, which shape post-2015 development framework is going to take. We didn't know whether it would take the goal framework or it is going to be completely different. But we said whatever it is, that framework must mainstream gender throughout. So, so um, for us, really was to, to ensure that our, our, our issues are hard. But we also know that before you achieve gender equality, it is also important to talk about inequalities in general, you know. Uh, so that's why it is uh, important. So when the report, the high level panel report came out, uh, we were able to see that some of the things we have advocated for are there. For example, the gender standard only goal was in the, in the, in the, in the report that the high level panel uh, produced and for us that was an achievement and it wasn't just a standalone goal that we were celebrating but also the issue that we were under that standalone goal we were able to see things like ending violence against women which never featured in the MDGs we were able to see things like property ownership which are things that are very important for addressing gender inequalities which we never saw in the MDGs and then we went on to read the report again and we looked at uh, other proposed uh, goals and we didn't see much of the mainstreaming really taking place, you know? And so uh, in, that, in, in the area of mainstreaming gender, we were not happy as women's rights activists or, or advocates. And we felt that they would have done more, especially with all the information that we have been giving, you know? Um, so I'll talk about then um, 
I think that's what I can talk about on the global perspective, on other, other AU or African Union uh, level. Uh, at the level of the African Union, uh, also um, the African Union has been trying to form a position as Africa. And the um, UNECA or the Economic Commission of Africa, the UN one, has been um, leading on this. Uh, support, uh, giving technical support, and and recently also African Development Bank came on to, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, to work with UNECA to consult widely and come up with Africa position that should be proposed to the heads of states and they adopt it. But of course that consultation, I don't know how many of you were consulted. <laughs> so that tells you how much that consultation was consultative. So. Uh, but some of us had the opportunity to participate in, at least in one of the four, I think there were only four consultations uh, that were organized in different parts of Africa. And so we participated in one which took place in Tunis. And, uh, and uh, again, we presented our findings, our, 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 our key position that we had been able to correct uh, by consulting other women. And um, during the... AU summit in May that just ended, which was also the celebration of the 50 years of the AU. Uh, the, the, the draft report was presented to the heads of states. And um, I understand that uh, during that time, a committee was put in place of heads of states to actually uh, look into that and take the lead on refining Africa position. But also a technical committee was also put in place, of course, which is the one that is going to do the technical work before it goes to the heads of states. And so, one, the technical committee is, uh, is, is being led by the UN, so which is also a problem because then we question the issues of ownership and whether that will really truly be an Africa position. Um, and then, um, so I think what is ahead of us as, as, as we move forward, especially as far as the Africa position is concerned, I think we are happy that at least the position has already been formed. That gives us an opportunity to shape it or influence it. So um, I think it will be important for all of us to see that draft, interact with the technical committee, inter you know, and find out. I know that um, President Salif Johnson has been uh, nominated to lead that the committee of the heads of states. However, we, it has not again made known who are other members, uh, other heads of states are going to be on that committee. It was only said that two heads of states from each sub-regions of Africa will be on that committee. So it will be interesting to even know who are those heads of state so we can start engaging with them and actually work with them to form the position so that we also influence that, influence that position. Um, yeah. So um, I think that's it really at the African Union level. Um, then going forward globally, I think Paul almost talked about a little bit about the Open Working Group, which was formed. Open Working Group was formed during Rio Plus 20 uh, conference. And um, this group was to work on SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. So we have two processes here. We have this one working on post-2015, looking at it from post-MDG perspective. But we also have the process that is working on SDGs from the Rio Plus 20 perspective. But what I understand that has been uh, confirmed is that the government then are coming into play. And this gov the, the, the open working group is the members of states that have been selected. I understand that that summit is mainly going to focus on implementation of MDGs, and it will just decide how the process of post-2015 is going to take place. But they're not going to discuss so much about post-2015 development framework. So it will be things like, do we want a negotiated post-MDG? Do we want to combine post-MDG process and, uh, and the SDGs? But uh, many people are saying that really it is obvious that that process are going to merge. And then the governments will take over. So it's very important to work with our governments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dina. It's very interesting some of the issues you've uh, articulated, and we'll come back to them, and uh, we'll look at uh, where Africa is when we are celebrating 50, 50 years, where, what is the status of, uh, of women in the process. But now let me turn over to the, uh, to the man in the room, and uh, that is uh, George. Uh, George, the, you, you, are, you, are, you have to represent a much larger constituency than, sit, than, uh, than the one that uh, is written in the, in the program. Because just about four days ago, uh, a team of which you are a coalition, that is the Global uh, Coalition Against Poverty, together with a global civil society which is called Beyond 2015, together with a network of civil society called the International Platform, of, uh, of, of, of NGOs, released a very interesting report on what they expect out of the post-2015 agenda. And it would be interesting to hear from you what that, what that report says, but then also tell us about what you are doing as GCAP. And I know many of us probably may remember GCAP from the Make Poverty History campaign, uh, which was the very, very first one that gave you a very strong platform. So tell us how that builds into what you're doing right now and how that builds into what is happening in Kenya within the post-2015 agenda. George, the floor is yours. Good evening. My name is George Mahinda, the chairman of GCAP Kenya. GCAP um, is a larger movement, as um, Akumu has pointed out, is actually a global movement. I'm just sharing uh, the Kenyan chapter. Fortunately, uh, we are working with another civil society movement called Beyond 2015, which has been alluded to and which is in the forefront in uh, moving the post-2015 agenda forward. And uh, again, um, one of the co-chairs happens to be Kenyan, Mwangi Waituru, in that global, in that uh, Bio 2015. And Bio, two Bio 2015 and GCAP, the two have teamed up and have, uh, to a large extent, been moving the civil society agenda globally. And I'm glad that um, seated here, the members we have here from um, FebNet, Accords, they're actually all part of uh, uh, that global movement. And uh, we managed to, to share quite a bit across the group. But I would like to confine myself to a large extent to what GCAP has been doing in Kenya. GCAP, as I said, is a global movement. It started around 2005. When it started, actually, the issue was um, to engage the national government towards attaining the MDGs. That was a hot issue at that point in time. But um, moving to 2011, the agenda kind of started uh, changing, as you can see, from the 2011 annual report of uh, the UN Secretary General. He made a statement uh, which went beyond accelerating the MDGs towards thinking about um, the aid, in this case 2015, nearing, and then thinking, therefore, beyond 2015. Now, an interesting thing he did mention at that time, but he did allude to three important things, that uh, as we went forward to dealing with this post-2015 agenda, we needed to be all inclusive, we needed to be open, we needed to be transparent, and therefore, a fairly consultative process had to be put in place. So that when we talk today about the process, you find these have been fairly um, participatory, fairly expansive, and I can confirm that in this country, we've had a fairly, uh, a fairly deep engagement with the populace. We've gone for what we call uh, trying to get the voices of the voiceless. Do you know the voiceless? Are you one of them? Are you one of them? Have we managed to leash you? Have we? Well, I'm glad, I'm glad if we've managed to, 
leave you out there because we've actually gone to the glass route. Light across from Kisumu, all across to places like Magarini in the coast, right through to places like Gliftu in uh, Wajia, far flung places across this country, through our member civil society organizations, through uh, the different um, NGOs. And as we said, um, GCAP being the upliner in this country. We've managed to work with uh, Beyond 2015. As I said, one of uh, the, the global coach happens to be a Kenyan. And only last June, we did manage to hold a national civil society organizations forum here in Nairobi. And we try to gather on uh, the different voices that uh, requires to be captured. Beyond that, we've also managed to engage with, um, with the government in a fairly, in again, a fairly uh, consultative process. We started with um, 11 sub-national consultations across this country. And then eventually a national consultation process. And only last week, we are coming from um, another national forum whereby the government is trying to put together all the voices of the citizens. And I can confirm here that um, I think for the first time, the government of Kenya has actually tried to get the voices of the government, or of, of its people. But we are continuing with the engagement to ensure that those voices are not lost along the way. Uh, because we know the government is actually right now putting together its, um, uh, those voices, is going to be making a position, we've made ours. Uh, and some of the issues, if we move forward, uh, Beyond 2015 and GCAP had come up with a framework, and the issues have actually been brought forward. Uh, one of the things is that this has had must have a human rights face. Uh, there must be equity, so that when you look at the part of the framework that we, we've been working along, is that um, fairly human rights, the issue of equity, the issue of uh, looking not just at poverty, but uh, looking at the socioeconomic uh, issues. Uh, we are saying that um, we need to include the responsibility. You remember when you talk about MDGs? It took us a long time, actually up to beyond uh, almost at half point, to really engage, engage with the government and civil society and the populace and the community. Around 2007, actually, that is when serious engagement with uh, the community started. But I'm glad the, the government did what they called um, localization of the MDGs for the for the common person to understand it. But what we are saying right now is that we should manage to engage with the government right from the right go, and I hope that will happen. We are also saying that uh, we should manage to engage with the community right from the right go. The community has a responsibility also, and that's something that uh, we did realize much, much later as we try to attain the MDGs. Then we are also saying that um, we need to engage with the private sector, the four PPPs, uh, because we, have, we are appreciating that in as much as we try to look at um, the government resources to move forward development, the, this is not going to be achieved. And the private sector is a much more versatile um, vehicle to use than just the government. The private sector moves much faster. So we are all saying that we need to have the four Ps. Public, private, um, uh, public, we need to have what? The public, private, Action. private partnerships. The three groups are important if we are going to manage to attain the MDGs. 
Now, of course, there are also other critical issues that we need to include. We said we need possibly to continue engagement with the MDGs and especially poverty. It has been mentioned that uh, gender needs to remain a start alone. Well, we'll see how that goes, but uh, we should also be careful not to lose out because uh, gender actually cuts across when you look at even the current MDGs, right from poverty, right from hunger, right through education, right through maternal health, infant um, mortality, through health, all those issues. In fact, the core happens to be the gender issue. So how we eventually ensure that um, we capture it within, uh, within all the other goals that we come up with. We must be very, very careful. And um, that is the position I'm giving from experience, or from experience of implementing the Millennium Development Goals as currently constituted. So that, um, so that when you look at environmental sustainability, for instance, we are saying that a lot of the things that we need to achieve from sustainable environment have, in fact, they hate women much more than, uh, than the, the other gender in this case. Because when you look at energy, for instance, you find is the women who use a lot of their time looking for the same. We know in this country that, for instance, we use more than 80% of our energy in the kitchen, in the rural area, actually comes from um, this firewood. Who looks for firewood? Who does farming in this country? So if it's women who goes looking for firewood, and then it's women who needs to go look for firewood, how do you share in between the two, the two responsibilities, the two duties? Which means when you go for firewood, you're also affecting food production. Because we are saying food production to a large extent in this country is through women, in as much as we don't capture that to a large extent. So you find most of uh, these areas, most of the goals that we would wish to be captured, we have to be very careful to balance and really ensure that um, the gender perspective is well catered for. So we are saying at the item number 12 that um, we need gender justice as, as an essential element in eradicating poverty. And we must ensure that exclusion does not play a role, which means we are still moving around the same thing. And then finally, there is the issue of financing. And I did mention that we need really to include um, the issue of local financing. You remember MDG number eight, to a large extent, was talking about mobilizing resources externally from our development partners. But they never made good of the 0.7%, uh, which they were supposed to limit for the same. So with that experience, what we are saying is that we may not possibly continue pushing them too hard. We must, uh, as you may have realized, st start having south-south engagement, especially in terms of resources mobilization. We must start thinking in terms of local mobilization of resources. That is within the national borders. Well, very quickly, some of the, just as, as a matter of summary, Poverty, I think that one we are in agreement. We are talking about human rights, I think again we are in agreement. We are talking about quality and equity in development. Um, and then we are talking about transformation. Transformation even to the extent that we are not only talking about consumption. To the extent that we are talking about people's mindset, because we are saying even poverty at times is in the mind. I don't know how many of us agree to that. To the extent that we need to change our attitudes. Uh, I think I've basically talked about uh, those others. Now, so what we are saying, beyond this, 
because this captured from uh, our deliberations as per last month. I said we've engaged the government beyond that, and I think a couple of other things have clocked up. Two possibly stand out. This includes, one, the issue of tradition, traditional, indigenous traditional uh, knowledge. Because we are saying, when you talk about uh, climate change, when you talk about resilience in this country, a lot of the things we need to do in terms of adaptation, in terms of mitigation, are well known to the Kenyan people, the Kenyan women, the Kenyan men, which means that becomes a key area for us to think about. Uh, indigenous knowledge as part of it. And then um, the other issue that cropped up, which I've already captured here, is the fact that we need really to find a way of engaging the community, the grassroots, the common person, which was missing so that uh, we can manage to move on. Thank you very much, George. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, it's, it's very interesting to hear what uh, GCAP has been doing. OK, so now we'll give all the, uh, we, we, we really appreciate and thanks a lot. And uh, Innocent, um, you have just been declared innocent by, uh, by the speaker before you, saying that for the first time the government is extremely consultative and has done and is, is committed to listening to the voice of the people. But Dina just declared you guilty because it says that the mainstreaming isn't doing very well. Uh, so, standing in between innocent and being guilty, tell us how the consultations have gone on and then tell us about the status uh, of uh, where the government is in regard to achieving the NDG. Okay, so uh, as, uh, as Mr. Okumu has introduced me, um, uh, my name is Innocent Maloba. I work at uh, the MDG's uh, unit in the Ministry of, Plan Ministry of Devolution and Planning. It was previously a Ministry of State for Planning. Uh, national development and the vision 2030, but all the functions still remain in the new ministry. Please go. And uh, my, the outline of what I'm going to talk about, I'll be very brief, eh? but I'll talk about the MDGs in Kenya. These include the status, the, stata, the current status, and probably a few highlights of uh, the, the status report. And then I'll also talk about the national consultations that we've had, the national consultations of the post 2015 development agenda and then I'll give a few highlights from these consultations. So, so I think I will not repeat this because uh, I think all the three speakers, all the two speakers who came before me touched about the, the origin of the MDGs. So yeah, and uh, just for purposes of uh, reminding everybody, I think this is the only thing that they missed. These were actually the eight goals. I don't know from a show of hands, how many of you know about the eight MDGs? Lift your hand high enough if you're proud and you know. Okay, that's, that's interesting. But we did a lot of work in terms of uh, sensitizing people and actually making the MDGs uh, a, a, a com common knowledge to, the, to, the, to, the, to the, the various segments of the Kenyan population. Since the declaration was signed in the year 2000 and the MDGs were crafted, it took us quite some time before we started actually thinking about the MDGs. And uh, in Kenya, it's about the year 2004. That's when the first uh, consultations were held. I think there was a consultation, uh, stakeholders meetings with the, the civil society and the private sector to just to get people to know about the MDGs. But luckily, in less than uh, two years, the MDGs had actually gained a lot of traction and they had become a principle in planning. Kenya actually started MDGs-based budgeting in the year 2004, and we've had quite lots of uh, lots of successes, uh, varied successes with that. And if if you're to look at the Kenya Vision 2030, which is the long-term blueprint in Kenya and the medium, the first medium-term plan, you'd actually notice that the MDGs feature across very very well in terms of uh, planning for for them. And uh, just uh, to give a small highlight on the, on the progress that has been, there's a lot which has happened since, uh, since Kenya started MDG's budgeting, but now I'll talk about what can be said about uh, the results. We've had, uh, for instance, in Goal 1. Goal 1 is about the eradication of uh, 
extreme poverty and hunger. We've had the po population of po uh, the proportion of the Kenyan population living below the poverty line reduced from uh, uh, about 52 percent in the year 2000 to about 45.9 percent in the year 2006. I know you may ask why am I quoting a figure which is very old, 2006. I'm sure that's about uh, eight years old. It's because that is the last household and budget survey that was done. Another one is in the offing, but uh, that, those are the current figures that we have for the moment. Although there is a recent, if you've been following the news, there is a recent World Bank uh, report which has estimates of uh, between 34 and 34% and 40%. That will be confirmed when the government does its own its own survey. In talking about goal two, we've got uh, increases in net enrollment for primary school, um, moving from 67.8 percent in the year 2000 to about 95.3 percent at the current year. And uh, that is not it may not seem like a big difference, but if you talk about the numbers, that's a very big change. Also, the primary to secondary school trans, uh, transition rates improvements from 66. 67% to about 73% between two years. But uh, the older figure of 2000 is not so different from, from the 2009 figure. Talking about goal three, and maybe the main theme of our meeting today, we've got uh, a very interesting scenario where we've got the proportion of women in parliament increasing from 4.1% in the year 2000 to about 9% in the year 2009. And uh, there are actually now much more members of parliament because of the constitutional provision. But if you are to look at it keenly, the number of, uh, of women who have been competitively elected into both houses has really gone down. The proportion is about 5% now. Uh, talking about gender parity in uh, primary school enrollment, the figures from the last economic survey, which was released about two months ago, indicate that gender parity has already been met at primary level. We still have challenges at the secondary and tertiary levels, but that is not a main achievement. It's actually a very good achievement. Talk about the share of women in wage employment, the modern sector, or rather the non-agricultural uh, employment. We have an increase uh, from 29 and a half percent to about 32 uh, percent between the year 2000 and 2011. Long period, a change of about three percent. Next. Uh, goal four, this is uh, child mortality, handling issues of child mortality. We've had the reduction of child mortality from uh, 77,000 deaths for everyone thousand children born in the year 2003. That was the closest survey done, the, closest, the survey that was done closest to two, the year 2000. This has uh, gone down to 52 for every 1,000 children uh, born in 2008. A five year difference, but also a large difference in terms of the rates. The under five mortality from 115 to from 115 for every thousand live births to about 74%, still an achievement, but maybe not on track if you are to look at 2009 and 2015, a few years remaining. And also, one of the things that are very important for child survival is actually immunization. We are doing fairly well. There, there is an increase almost every other year. Currently, it's at 81%. Next. Goal five, this is one of the goals that uh, I'm not saying it's one that affects women most, but it's one in which women have a very big uh, interest in, because everybody is a candidate for pregnancy and maternal health, <laughs> maternal health then becomes uh, something of interest to you. So less than half of uh, births in Kenya, we're talking about 43%, as at the last uh, demographic and health survey, which was conducted in the year 2008-2009. Just about 43%. And you know that's a very big indicator because you, when you deliver in hospital, your chances of uh, a healthy delivery and survival after that are very high. The maternal mortality rate, we've had an increase from 414 to 488 between the year 2003 and 2008-9. 
this is uh, 480. Like for every 100,000 live births, you have about 488 mothers losing their lives. The proportion of women using at least a method of uh, contraception, we had a, a significant increase also from 39% to 46% between a seven year period of uh, 2011 and uh, 2003. And the unmet need for family planning, this again, the focus has really been on women, although men also should take a role, is 24%, which is a reduction from the previous years. Yes. Goal six, we talk about uh, the national HIV prevalence. The MDG's target group is actually 15 to 24 years. This registered a reduction from 3.6% in 2003 to 3% in 2008. And talking about the other age group, about uh, 15 to 49 percent, 15 to 49 years, we've had a reduction from 6.7 percent in 2003 to 6.3 percent in 2008. That may seem like a very small difference, but it's a lot when you look at the absolute numbers. But this data also has very interesting characteristics. We've got very different uh, figures from different regions. For instance, in uh, in Garissa County we've got less, just about 1%. And if you go to Homa Bay County, you're talking about more than 14%. And also, if you look at the data, the prevalence for women is much, much higher than that of men. Next point. <coughs> MDG 7, ensuring environmental sustainability. The three targets that we'll talk about is the proportion of people with access to clean drinking water. Currently, it's at 52.6%. Uh, this is actually the people who have got access to drinking water. The figure, I, I'm not making a comparison because the figure we have and the, pre the figure that was there in the previous year are not comparable because the measure was different. But this is the status at the moment. And uh, you can see just be between 2009 and the time we are making the report, an additional 5.9 million people have been provide have been, uh, have actually been made to have access to to water and sanitation especially from the rural water programs and then talk about uh, adequate sanitation also 61% as at the last uh, census which was done in 2009 i'm also not making a comparison because the other measure is not comparable we were looking at households but this one is actually the actual pro proportions goal seven goal sorry goal eight this is a global uh, a partnership for global development and uh, maybe just before i talk about anything how many of us here do not have a mobile phone raise your hand up okay we won't give you one we just want to know <laughs> How many doesn't how, how many of you don't have a mobile phone? Okay, nobody. That's a very good sign. How many of you never have uh, have no access whatsoever to the internet? You may want to access the internet but you don't have access. That speaks volumes about the target on ICTs. It's one of the the areas that we've really done very well. And uh, there are many applications that are actually coming from Kenya which are being used uh, all over in the world. However, the goal is not only about ICTs. We have the issues of trade and uh, aid. When it comes to trade-related targets, we are not doing so well. There are more highlights in the report. I'm not in a position to talk about it now because these are, these are some of the ones I thought actually I could just refer you to the report and talk about the progress in summary, talking about goal one, again, this is summative, because if you go to goal one, like I mentioned, there are 21 targets and 60 indicators. So the performance is varied across. But generally, goal one, we are, we, are, we are not on track, and this is a goal that is unlikely to be met by the year 2015. Improve uh, mental maternal health, clearly from the figures that I've given, I, it goes without saying that this one is unlikely to be met by the year 2015. There's also good progress in uh, goal six and goal seven. But when it comes to goal eight, the issues of uh, trade and uh, aid, we are lagging behind. And that will probably inform why this is the review. 
that is actually forms part of the review. Mr. Okumu called it the review of the MDGs. We try to retain the simplicity and the affirmative action nature of the MDGs. We're not throwing away the MDGs, at least from the ministry's point of view. We want to, because they've really worked for, for us, they've really helped to, to focus resources, to focus uh, planning and budgeting. Uh, in, in such a way that uh, if the, the, the MDGs are met, then it's very possible for us also to meet the Vision 2030 and all of other goals. In fact, coming back from the year 1965, we'd actually see that the MDGs were more or less a Kenyan invention. And that's a joke, but, uh, <laughs> but the, the session on paper number 10 on African socialization and its application to planning actually highlighted three areas of uh, poverty. Uh, what were the other area? areas? Somebody remind me. Education, okay, there was health, education, and illiteracy. If you look at all those areas, they are very well covered in the MDGs. So uh -huh. we had 12 counties, consultations in uh, the counties are there. And then after the, 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 the first meeting was more or less like a planning meeting. We met with other ministries and tried to figure out what to do. And uh, from that, we started having the national consultation. But after having the, the national, the county dialogues. And then after that, we also consulted the CSOs, our own process of consulting CSO. I know the CSOs also had their own process. But we, 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 we convened CSOs, national CSOs, sought their views and after that we also had now just very recently a national stakeholders forum just coming out of uh, last week we are still in the process of of uh, compiling the the report to which will also inform the 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 the, the Kenya's position but i like to mention that two of our partners in these consultations have been the republic of uh, finland through their embassy in nairobi and the undp kenya so the gaps that came out from the consultations in a summary was that at least the first, uh, the, 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 there was inadequate participation and also the strong focus of the MDGs on social sectors may have reduced the importance attached to investment in infrastructure. And then the issue of inequalities, I've given you a sneak preview of how that may look like. And also key issues which have emerged but have been, were, were initially left out, climate change, conflict, governance, security, disability, and all judge. It's not the whole list. And then the issue of uh, availability of uh, properly disaggregated data for tracking. I think I'd like to stop there. These are, uh, because all the recommendations that came out from that, that those, those consultations were actually based on these gaps. Yes, I'd like to stop there. Yes. Thank you very much, thank you very much. I think that's, that's very well appreciated and um, I think it's good that the government is making a little bit of, of progress, especially in terms of, uh, of, the, of the consultations into the next process and we are very glad that the constitution now makes it mandatory and uh, the teachers were saying that they have discovered they don't achieve anything until they go out. So uh, it's good that the consultations are now working. But Philogene, uh, I know that you work with Femnet that is based in a number of countries in Africa. But just listening to, to Innocent uh, trying to make the case for what is happening in Kenya, the question that I, I ask myself, uh, even as a man, is in 2013, why does a woman still have to die just because they're giving birth? I mean, it's, it's a, it, it's, it sounds so, so much out of place in a country where everybody has got internet and everybody has got a, has, has got a mobile, that we are still talking about 43%. You know, that means it's nice to say we've improved, but that, that means there's 57% that are actually fearful when they are going to do a very natural process, which is why we are here. So the, the question is, from a Kenyan perspective, do you really think we are going far? Do you think we are making progress? And what is civil society doing as we look to the post-2015? I'm among those who are now looking at that risk in the next few months. <laughs> so maybe that's why I'm very actively involved in this process. You never know. But then I'd like to throw back that question to the room. Because it's one thing to know the eight MDGs, but it's another thing to feel the impact. So how many of us feel that the MDGs have impacted my life in one way or another? Confidently, a little bit. <laughs> 
yes, maybe just one or two, three people can just stand up and say how, and, and then we can, we can bring the points back home, we can bring this discussion back home, because I feel right now it's up there, and you know everybody's hearing SDGs, post trio, and we can't make the connection. So who might, yeah, okay. <laughs> The access to the internet has become much easier and more affordable. Okay. So internet directly has impacted us, right? It's opened up the space for ICT and a thriving environment for that. Somebody else? Um, in the line of the eight MDGs, mm -hmm. um, in regard to the localization, mm -hmm. they have really started making sure that the governments within Africa and everywhere are looking forward to looking at policies and act within the legislative that actually make sure, even post the MDGs, mm -hmm. all the eight goals and other issues that we're talking about, sustainable development mm -hmm. becomes a reality in Africa. So besides the education, when we look at countries, constitutions, education is now behold MDG, mm -hmm. health, mm -hmm. environment, name it. Mm -hmm. So I would say it was really good that MDGs came to be so that the governments mm -hmm. within different constituencies can work around making it a reality mm -hmm. for the people within the country. That's true. They've streamlined governments, right? There are some of the things we've seen in our constitution, and when that constitution was being passed, people were like, is that going to be real in Kenya? Yeah? But that's what also global commitments do, because it trickles down to the society. And now, because it's a women discussion, can we have a, women, a, like a, a feminine example, a woman example? Somebody who's been impacted one way or another? No, the women are not satisfied with the MDGs. Not at all. No. Okay, because that's what we've been doing in terms of the national consultations with women. We have worked with Groots, which is the grassroots uh, organization uh, operating in sisterhood. And they have um, networks at the ground. And some of the issues that are coming up, are, I'm going to highlight a few of them. One is education, on the issue of education. Well, we agree that we've achieved free primary education and the, and the enrollment has been pretty high. Is this um, disaggregated by gender? Because we also know the environment for women to learn and young girls to learn might not be the same as men. And so we are saying while we are achieving education, can it be quality education? Can we have ratios that if it's a teacher to student ratio, is it something that will impact the student? Or we are having the numbers in thousands as we have seen, but there's no enough facilities. Something else that's coming up is healthcare. We are saying that um, in as much as we are saying we're improving the healthcare services, we have seen all the statistics, how does this impact on the women? When we say, uh, this, and I'm going to quote exactly what they said, I was in a forum and they were discussing about the maternity, free maternal healthcare. And they were saying, these are civil society organizations, grassroots women, they are saying, we will not advocate for something that is free if it will compromise the life of our mothers and our children. So while we are advocating for yes, we want to access the healthcare, is it quality healthcare? And that is what we are pushing for in the post-2015 development agenda. Thirdly, we are looking at water and sanitation. How accessible is this? We live in the urban areas. How many of us have problems with water in our houses? Okay, how many of us do not have problems? Let me ask. <laughs> how many of us do not have problems? We don't have problems. Nairobi, you live in Nairobi? Kikuyu. Kikuyu? You live in Nairobi? Okay, so it's, it's, it's a countable few, yeah? So even us who feel that we are in the developed part of the country, we still have challenges with water and sanitation. Now the woman who's in the rural area has it worse because she has to walk miles to get that water and the kind of repercussions it has in terms of diseases, yeah? So those are some of the issues that are coming up. Um, thirdly, there's the issue of work. And they say we want secure income and decent work. Because you say we are creating employment for our youth, but is it decent? Is it decent? We, do we look back and say, I am proud? If somebody asks you, Unafanya kazi wapi, where do you work? <laughs> you know, people will just see you leaving, but we want decent work for our young women, our older women, and the youth. Yeah? Those are some of the issues that are coming up. And of course, we say that all this has to be anchored in honest leadership and good governance. Because we know this is, I'm sad to say, this is Africa. <laughs> and corruption is an issue for us. And so we say for us to achieve this post-2015 uh, development framework, what is the accountability? And our accountability mechanism is through our leadership and our governance. And even on the start of uh, electing our leaders, we are already starting on a very bad note, eh, with piglets being thrown <laughs> and bees are here being unleashed. Yeah? But we know that if we don't have that good governance, all these things we are advocating for, 
It will just be on paper and they will not be implemented, yeah? Um, finally, we are pushing for the issue of peace, security and justice. Because in developing countries, we know this has been quite an issue and it was overlooked in the previous MDG. And so when we saw the, um, the high level panel report, these are some of the things we've been advocating for constantly at a national level and also at a global level like Dina had mentioned. And so uh, as Dina has alluded, we saw these things in the HLP report, which goes beyond the previous framework. And you know the Millennium Declaration, was anybody consulted about that? No. But yet we can see things like free primary education have come up from that and, and the free maternal health care. So can you imagine how much more can come out if you give your voices? And you will say, I gave my voice, it went there, and now I can hold them accountable. So it's very important to be part of this consultation. And so Feminet also has a platform to collect views, because once the report has been released, um, Dina highlighted the issues that have been featured and some of the gaps that are yet to be featured. So you please, after this, see myself, and we have the Feminet team. <laughs> you can just wave. And we'll be collecting your views. And, we, and you can see we are trying eh, at a national level, regional, any, any, any route that we are able to get our voices in there, we are going to do it until the framework is finalized. And so we have a response which we'll be able to share, but we're able to welcome some of the things that they highlighted. For example, having a standalone goal on gender, which talks about um, economic empowerment, uh, also including the issue of universal access to sexual and reproductive health care. Because once it's at the global commitment level, we have learned it trickles down to the national governments, right? And so there are some of the things that they've done that are very well and we have commended, but there are some of the things we still want to push, especially as developing countries and in our Kenyan context. Yes. Uh, right. Now, finally, to, uh, to cap it all, as always happens, you know, after everybody else has spoken, lawyers always come to tear it apart. And uh, we have a lawyer. Is <laughs> Juliana from uh, from Accords, but Juliana just listening to what is happening, listening to fellow Jean speaking and talking about the fact that now we have to get engaged. We are not involved in the Millennium Declaration, but still some good things came out of it. Listening to the, to the government talking about the fact that, uh, despite the fact that the Constitution allows for the participation of women, in terms of elections, meaning the women who actually have citizens voting for them, is actually gone down. Uh, so that, that tells you a lot about the kind of attitude we have vis-a-vis -a, -vis a document called the Constitution and people's attitudes and, and mindset. Uh, in the legal fraternity, I know that the women are, uh, are moving, but even within the law society of Kenya, it's, not, it's still a man's world. So what is, what is happening at Accords, but specifically from a legal and as a lawyer, what do you see as, as the way forward? even with the 960 or so days we have left with the MDGs? Um, first, probably, I'll begin by saying the danger with speaking last is probably everything has been said, but not everything has been said by everyone. So beginning with your question, Okumu, probably what I think is that we need to change strategy. We need to change strategy in terms of how we approach issues like a women representation. Yes, probably we have 47, we have 47 women representatives, but as uh, my brother from the Ministry of Planning has said, the number of women who've actually been elected by the public without know, the affirmative action has come down. So what can we do? Think about it as we go through the discussion and we'll have that um, conversation at the end. So um, we have to appreciate that uh, women in Kenya form the majority, 51% of the total population, um, is women. That said, we must appreciate that um, we must appreciate that the role of women um, we play a pivotal role towards development. Uh, and now the challenge is on us. What can we do? I am with my sisters who are saying that we need a standalone goal. We cannot say that uh, as long uh, as long as mainstreaming is done. And, and gender is a cross-cutting issue, that will do. No, we need our own goal on it. Uh, this commitment, all this commitment, I can say, offer a framework towards strengthening action and accountability to advance gender equality and women's rights in countries wide, worldwide. One thing I have not had mentioned is, uh, is the United Nations uh, Security Council Resolution 1325 on 
participation of women in the peace process. We didn't have that in the previous MDG. We didn't have peace or conflict as a standalone goal in the previous, in the framework that we are in and that we're reviewing towards post-2015. And I think we all admit that women suffer the most in terms of when there is conflict. It's the women who are most affected. But do we see women being involved in the peace process? Do we have women um, speaking on issues of their decisions or opinions being heard? We don't hear that. Nationally, we, we've been speaking a lot about that, on how we have a progressive constitution, women can now pass citizenship to their children, whether they are married um, to Kenyans, whether or not they are married to Kenyans, equal rights in marriage, shared parental responsibility, and all that, including a, a very progressive article, Article 43, that speaks on um, highest attainable standards of health, including reproductive health. But what do we see actually on the ground in terms of even um, the, the equal rights in marriage? We've been having the family bills pending in parliament for the longest time. Why do we have, have them pending in parliament all that time? Really, is it that they are bad? Is it that no one can review them? Is it lack of political will? Is it something, it's something that we actually need to think about? Okay, the Millennium Develop, uh, Declaration 2000 has been discussed. Uh, my brother from the Planning Ministry has gone through all the, the goals that, that were there from MDG 1 to MDG 8, so I, I think I'll skip that. But now specifically on MDG 3, as, as it's been popularly known specifically on, on women's rights and gender equality, targets to eliminate gender disparity in primary and, and secondary education the first uh, indicator, the first target, preferably by 2005 and at all levels by 2015. We can say that, okay, maybe before I go to that, and um, share of women in wage, in wage employment in the non agriculture sector, that has been said, proportion of seats held by women in national assembly, that we've said, and now we had an addition on full and, and productive employment and decent work, especially for women and youth. Um, which was adopted in 2005. Maybe you can go to the next slide. From the initial stages, it was claimed rightfully that MDG3 had a very narrow interpretation of gender equity, which is true. We, however, got consolation from the fact that half of the MDGs and targets directly related to gender equity and women empowerment, like MDG1 on decent work for women, MDG2 and 3 on, on girls' education, and, and MDG5 on maternal mortality and sexual and reproductive health which was a good thing. Uh, going back to what I think Philogen has said, we need to articulate or have gender and women's rights as a cross-cutting issue in all, whichever framework we come up with or whichever framework that we have now, we need to have gender and women's rights as a cross-cutting issue because we realize that, um, that for us to be able to achieve gender parity, gender equality or women's rights, we have to be able to achieve the others as well. And if we're not able to achieve the others, we cannot be able to, to achieve uh, gender equality. Go to the next slide. Now, looking back to about 13 years of hard work towards achieving this gender equality and women's um, empowerment, what are our successes? What challenges have we faced along the way? And what lessons and good practices can we carry to the post-2015 agenda? Um, He's talked of free primary education and how we've been able to achieve that, to, to have uh, most children going to school. But then, do we monitor and follow up these children to ensure that the ones that are enrolled remain to school, remain in school and go to the next level? Um, do the enrollment in primary school actually translate into the number of children, um, I mean, yeah, we can call them children, joining high school and universities? Does it? I don't think so. Um, uh, another thing we can do to help maybe that is avail scholarships and initiatives such as, um, such as a CDF to ensure that children from indigent backgrounds continue with education. Another initiative that has really helped the girl ch child is the um, ensuring provision of uh, sanitary towels to ensure these girls still go, go on uh, going to school even when they have their menstrual cycle. These are the small things that are unique to women. And that's why I'll keep supporting having a standalone goal. 
because these are some of the issues that we can say will be addressed in another goal or something else. They are very unique to women. They might look like small issues, but they really affect the quality of education. Probably that um, our children get, we can go to the next. Um, we can say that uh, the number of women working, I like the way he defends the government, the number of, of uh, women working in the non-agriculture sector has improved. However, how many, how many women do we have holding senior positions in government? How many women do we have? Women, we still, Chini, we're still holding the small jobs, the jobs that don't have many responsibilities or titles. Another thing that I think would be coming in to help women, um, to help us towards um, empowering women is adult literacy. Maybe if you work to the community, sometimes you go to the community and find a woman who can really articulate issues. They understand issues, they can be a leader, but they do not have the education. So the adult education class, uh, adult uh, literacy classes would be very, very useful. Um, now, women representation in politics, as uh, he mentioned. According to research by the UN Nations United Group, even, in the, even if the current rate of inclusion of women in parliament in the world continues, we will not be able to achieve parity in another 40 years. And anyway, are we willing to wait for 40 years to achieve parity? I was um, earlier having a discussion with Catherine, and, and I was giving her the example of Rwanda and how they just emerged from a genocide and they were able to, they now have 56% of women in parliament. But then she was asking me, do the women in parliament, how do they get into parliament? And when they're in parliament, are they able to articulate women issues? Or do they owe allegiance to the men who ensured that in parliament, so that now women issues still are not brought to the forefront? So that's one thing, and maybe I can echo, I can't remember who said, it's, it's not an issue so of, of women are not able, it's the political will is key in achieving equality in, in political participation. And that has been said a lot. We, we, Kenya is an economic giant in Eastern Africa, but then we still have the few number of women in parliament, uh, even less than Southern Sudan, which is less than five years old, <coughs> I'm sure. And now maybe still on political representation of women in parliament. The two-third gender rule, you all know what happened. It was very disappointing when, when we found that article in the constitution, all women celebrated. Uh, not more than two-thirds two of women will be able to hold these seats. These seats. But then what did the, the constitutional, the Supreme Court, and we don't have another, another channel, by the way. After the Supreme Court, we just go back and re-strategize because it's the, it's the highest court in the land. So those are some of the issues that still bring us down as women. So what would we recommend to do as we go forward in, in um, ensuring that we achieve MDG3 and even going towards post-2015? We need to invest more in women's participation in governance at the local level. At the local level. As I was saying, it's at the local level that you realize this woman is able to, is able to do this. It is crucial to provide women with opportunities and incentives to lead, to lead at the local level where results of women leadership can often be seen. And this will make people see, oh, she was able to do this, she was able to do this, then we can vote for her to represent us at, at, at the next level. And then the temporary measures such as the quota system, the women represent, uh, representatives position has increased. Um, though the number of parliament has reduced, as he said. So the quota system, I'm also um, not very sure, maybe we can discuss that if you think it's effective in terms of probably you owe allegiance to a party. So then are you pushing for the women's agenda well at, um, when at the, uh, in parliament? And then proportional representation, creating an even playing field for women and, and men. Um, within political parties, which is something that has worked very well in the West, like um, Finland, if I can give an example. Uh, we have the acts, we have the Sexual Offenses Act, we have the Female Genital Mutilation Act as a country, but then we still have so many children, girl children, being mutilated. Why do we have that? Why do we have that? Is it that people don't know about Sexual Offenses Act? The implementation of these acts is still 
lacking, which is something that we need to look at. As we keep on saying, oh, we have MDG3, we have the constitution, we have these laws, is there implementation actually taking place to ensure that, that the objects of the, of the laws or the constitution are met? The post-2015 development agenda needs to, to, be con to be in context and integrated and further broken down to the community level. We were having um, a discussion on how to go about the national consultations with some CSOs, and we were wondering, do we begin by telling them what, is, what are MDGs? Because we will go to the community, nobody understands what are MDGs. So when we come up with a new framework, we need to start from the word go, from the beginning, informing people. Post-2015, I mean, the new development goals are these. And this is what they mean, in a language that they understand, so that then we can move towards development on the same page. Um, we need to appreciate, the, uh, like uh, he said, local knowledge and solutions. We cannot say we are coming up. Things don't come from up, down. They come from down. People have solutions on their own. We just need to improve them. Do we, do we have enough personnel? Do we have the facilities that are needed in the hospitals to make sure that women get their children safe in the hospitals? That said, um, I would want to stop there. Probably I have one more slide. My last words are borrowed from Frin, uh, Frini Jinwala. He's a former speaker of the South African National Assembly. She's a woman. She said, inclusion of the perspectives and, uh, um, of women in decision making will inevitably lead to solutions that are more viable and satisfy a broader range of society. I will stop there and thank you very much. Thank you. I thank you very much. You know, they, let, let me just come to you, uh, Dr. Kiara Ann. You, you're a lecturer but you also deal with women a lot uh, in your career every single day. So let's forget this high table for a while. Let's, let's forget about what's happening globally. Let's come down to what is happening every single day. Let's look at the manifesto that um, the Jubilee government produced and how they are pushing uh, to have it implemented and the speed with which they're doing. And then just listening to, the, to, whatever, to, what, to what has happened and listening to the government's progress. And you can see there's quite a lot of disparity. Julian has stayed, so many rules are there, so many bills are, whatever, so many bills are pending. The Sexual Offenses Act is there. We had all this gender rule that was put, and then the Supreme Court, which actually has got quite a good number of women, themselves turned against you, and they said, actually, you are not very right. So when, when, when you listen to all this, is it all politics? Or do you think that there is, there is something substance in going through this process and cycles of developing goals when we, when we probably need to look at what our politicians are doing and where they're headed and where our laws are? Thank you very much for this opportunity. Ah, I feel for women. One, because I'm one, I'm a mother, and I'm also a doctor who deals with women on a day-to-day -day basis. I'll start right from where I think MDGs should be addressed. The mother and the baby. The two, you cannot separate them. And unfortunately, did it take any one of us to have a man to give birth to us? Who did it take? You all born by who? A woman. A significant woman. In fact, I think you need to applaud every woman in this house. And for me, when you talk about gender rights, it starts right there. The bedrock is the woman. When you look at poverty, unfortunately, it's still the woman. We toil in the shamba. Those of us who even work in hospitals, you know even the remuneration there is different between a man and a woman. So it doesn't matter however small or however big you are. When you look at education, it's the first person who gets dropped off. The boy child has always been carried on. I'm lucky and privileged. I was with a twin when I was growing up, and he was a man. And I remember those haggles we used to have, where I'd be told, go to the kitchen and cook for your brothers and sisters. While he sat or played, I had to prove myself two times over that I can get somewhere. You move from education, you come to the empowerment and the rights of a woman. 
Unfortunately, in Kenya, the social cultural context really dictates we are a patriarchal system. But how can we change some of these things that are so ingrained and inborn? Then you look at the child. Yes, we're saying we're doing well with the baby's survival. National, innocence. But you know what? When you critically look, if the mother dies at birth of that child, that baby doesn't breastfeed, that baby doesn't get bonded with, that baby is at a high risk of diarrheal diseases, that baby is actually going to eventually die. It's worse even when you go in the rural setup. Maternal health. I know our indicators are going in the opposite direction. And this is why I'm saying the context is bigger than we actually just say a figure. We're at 488. We should be, and I wish you had put the we should be on the national statistics, we should be at 147. Now in Kenya, what makes news? Have a matatu that gets bashed out? That's news. Now let me give you bigger news. You're having about 30 matatus per day of women that are dying. Now let's look at HIV and AIDS. It's worse off. Biologically, the woman is already more vulnerable because of her genetic and her biological makeup. And HIV predisposes to TB, predisposes to cancers. Okay? Now you look at the environment. Who tills the land? And some of you ladies will say, okay, I am not in the farm. I'm a, an urbanite, so to speak. So as an urbanite, you're busy bumming in your car. But what pollutants are we throwing back out into the air? And then you want to come back and tell me, our climate is okay? Food for thought. Then we have our developing partners, number eight. Agreed, we must be helped. So-called low resource, isn't it? We must be helped by those who have plenty. But even now, those who have plenty, which is the first world, are beginning to ask, we don't have even to serve our own. It's a high time Kenyan said, okay, come, if you have to give us help, but give us help in our own agenda. Not what you feel. I'm in the project world, my friend. So they come and they tell us, I want us to look on this specific line. It may not be the Kenyan priority. So this is for me what I think 2015 and beyond should give us. Number one, prioritization of our own agenda. We have a fantastic constitution. In fact, whoever did the blueprint, I think were guys who were awake or ladies who were awake. But coming down to the county, 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 that's where the grassroots is. How can we bring up the community? I think all the speakers have spoken eloquently. The community to understand plainly, simply, that their lives matter. What is the monitoring and evaluation of all those MDGs at the county level? And do we get a feedback at the county? And that begs governance. That begs an insight into our social cultural practices. The, the one that's going on in Kisumu is not what's happening in Central. And it's certainly not what's happening at Coast. Just taking those three, I look at the prioritization agenda, just looking at the woman as the key focus. It's different. One side has HIV. One side has got tourism and all the problems that are coming up. That's the coastal belt. When you come to Central, we are plaguing with cancers. So prioritization from the county level. Now, everything for free is not necessarily free. It can be very expensive. We look at the education, and we're now beginning to see what's happening in our maternities. We are bogged. To be honest, we are totally bogged. Good concept. Access has been made freely available and more or less equitable for everybody. But what is the quality? For me, I think we need to start looking seriously at the quality of services being provided. The other thing is men. There are a lot of men in this house, which is good. But how do we engage men to be responsible 
and responsibly engaged and active participants to realize we need to develop as a block. So male involvement. Then, I didn't hear anything at all on prevention strategies. We have our youth who are bleeding, and I'll use the word bleeding. They are unemployed, yet educated. The younger generation. The dot com. Me, I'm a before computer age person. Yeah? So the analog. How do we bring in this young brain to actually help in our national development and not get wasted away in alcohol or drug use and abuse, which then brings on a deteriorating health cycle? They're more vulnerable to sexuality. They're more vulnerable to STDs. The women are more vulnerable to unwanted pregnancies and abortions that result from it. It goes on and on and on and on. So how can we engage gainfully the youth? There is a special group close to my heart, persons with disabilities. They are still not being addressed. I ask so many times, even on our corridors, just the infrastructure in the hospital I work, which is Kenyatta National Hospital, how do they even get these people to even gain access to care, gain access to information, and therefore take stock of their own lives? Please let's think about them. Now, finally, 2015 isn't far. And I'll give you something that I want you to think about. Because in the first world, they're bleeding from this. Too much salt in your food. Too much refined sugars in your food. A sedentary lifestyle. All right? Are we together so far? And finally, the issue of use of alcohol. They're all S's. Non-communicable diseases. We cannot run away from them. They're begging on our kind of lifestyles. And we are getting more and more hypertensives, more and more obesity and diabetes, more and more cancers. Where is that agenda post-2015? Thank you. And maybe that's probably where I want to begin by challenging the panelists a little bit. When you listen to Juliana and then uh, you listen to uh, Dr. Ari, you ask yourself if, we are af if women are affected almost by everything that happens, why are we stuck to we must have a goal? That whereas some, some progress has been made on some goals uh, in terms of mainstreaming, very little has been done. So the question is, aren't you then losing the battle by focusing on this goal while you're actually losing everything else on, or ever, on all the other places? Thank you, Paul. I don't think I said my preference is just to have a, a standalone goal on gender equality and women empowerment. We want both. And we want both of them to be perfect because they are both needed. We want a, a standalone goal on gender equality because it addresses inequalities and factors that actually cause gender inequalities in the first place. Because, and then we want mainstreaming gender in all other goals, if you are taking the goal framework, because then we deal with the issues that already ex are in existence. When you talk about education, there's already an issue of boys and girls that are attaining education at the same level. And so we want that mainstreamed in education. We want gender mainstream in education. When you talk about poverty, we know that the majority of women are the ones that are poor. Therefore, we want to actually put targets that are going to ensure that women um, focus on and uh, are pulled up to ensure that th then they don't continuously be the majority in, in poverty. In, uh, that Experience, that are experiencing poverty. But that target is not going to address why it is the majority of women that are poor. Okay. <laughs> interesting, an interesting response. And uh, in, a, uh, in about 2011, uh, the UN w Women commissioned a report uh, about uh, between uh, business within the private sector and government, the achievement of the 30 percent, uh, whatever, r rule of uh, the number of women. And one of the uh, or number of women in positions and in government, and one of the most interesting things is that the government had actually achieved more than 30 percent 
it was somewhere around 32 percent but interestingly all those who are ladies who make tea the ladies who are cooks in the government offices, the ladies who are secretaries, the ladies who are permanent, uh, uh, who, are, who are assistants. But when you add it all, it actually reads 30%. And so the question that I am thinking, do you think, uh, from a government perspective dealing with all this, that actually what is needed is a goal, or do we just abandon all these goals and say, you know what, if you just focus on that goal of achieving this, you will not go far from our perspective as a government? I don't know about uh, the statistics that you're using, but uh, what, 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 what I'd like to say is that uh, the best foundation for empowerment of women is actually looking at the structure of education. Because uh, uh, I, I, I know, even Kenya, I think those of us who were born in the 70s, uh, probably you saw your first instant uh, tea or instant coffee cup, maybe somewhere late in the in the 1990s. So I believe the foundation is already there. We have a new constitution, and uh, if we have gains made at uh, ensuring equal access to women, and women here, I, 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 I beg to separate. They are girls. You have to, first of all, to start think, thinking of women as girls when they're in primary school, and then they grow on to become women. So if you have enough, uh, just as, uh, because if we have about, uh, the same number of girls uh, joining primary school and completing and transiting on to the tertiary institutions, then you know one of the ways to acquire capital is actually to to be able to to at least uh, improve your chances of employment and be able to work. So I believe that's a very good foundation, and I think the government has really done a lot because if you, if you remember in these years, uh, joint admissions board intake there was actually a, 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 a move made to lower the entry point for girls by about two points. So I think by and by, uh, the gains are going to be realized. Yeah, Maybe not as fast as you may wish, but they are, they, they, the gains are going to be realized because the foundation is already there. Yes. George, uh, Daktari has ended with a cry and asking, how do we engage men? How do we change the mindset of men? I don't think goals will, or I don't think having an MDG 6 or an MGD 12 will. But sitting there as a father and sitting there as a man, what will it take to change the mind of men in this country? I don't know whether I start by what somebody said in Moranga during one of the consultations. And uh, because really it's not just men, but it's a question of. Um, uh, our mindset as a whole, because I said even for poverty is really in uh, to an extent in our minds as a starting point. So not just men, but um, again going to the Muranga case, uh, it was an issue of even the laws are in place, uh, but uh, why is it that they are not applicable? So the issue was actually on enforcement. And the old man, I don't know whether we have people from Moranga, um, said that we possibly need to go back to Ile Kiboko. Yeah? He's an old man. He must have gone through the, <laughs> the white man's era. You, you remember even the Chiefs Act. Uh, because we must start seeing women, ladies, girls as our sisters. I, I don't know where we, become, we start becoming separate. Yet, even as you separate, you still uh, eventually end up being a husband, therefore with a lady being... So, I, I don't know where eventually you start separating out, uh, but we really must change. And it's not just for the men, surely. It's not just for men. Even, even the ladies, at times, we play a lot to that. We must start out and say no to what is not right. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you can. Philogene, I, you hear the man speaking, and you've heard about the government talking about this, the statistics. But let me just uh, read for you a few things that uh, are happening even as we, as we speak. 
If you look at a, re a report that was done by Grant Thornton, which is talking about the place of business, uh, what about the place of women, it says the truth is that there are actually 50% uh, of, the, of the global population that are women. But when you look at the women that are in top positions within the private sector, they are no more than 3% globally. When you come and then you look at an organization that keeps on talking a lot about women, that's the United Nations, it's interesting that the statistic that was released actually by the UN Focal Point for Women says that uh, over the last, between 2004 and 2009, that's looking at five years, that's how the statistics we have, the number of women in senior positions has actually increased by only 5%, from about 33% to about 38%. But out of that, the, the number of, of staff has increased by a huge margin, meaning that even the UN itself is finding it a difficulty to live about what it is talking about. And so the question that I, I, am then, I am then asking myself is, at the end of the day, sitting as a woman and looking at this global process, what do you think are the things that we need to focus on right now to make sure that we don't end up talking about things, but then in practice we are completely far, including those of us who talk them. I'm, I'm almost tempted to ask uh, in feminine how many men are there. <laughs> you know, and then also attempted to move to another uh, to whatever to those of us who are in organizations and ask how many how many women do we have? So the question is, how do we move away from the documents into some practical steps of what you can apply? Okay, um, perhaps I will support and strongly support Dina, in as much as we are saying that we need one goal that addresses gender. Because the point of having this goal is that women have been historically marginalized. And the point is we want, women can't keep on playing catch up. Because in as much as you create for them employment positions and they don't have education, how will you justify that? So that's why we have to create these positions, the quarters, even as we improve their educational status. And so that is the point of advocating for one goal which has certain indicators. If it is decent income, if it is ending violence against women, that enables us to come up to the same level in the same society. But then because this is a development agenda, meaning it's something that is moving on. So we have to continue moving on with what is happening. The society won't sit back and wait. Let, where are the women? Let's get them educated. Let's get them in the right situation. Then we move together. No. Even as we are being brought back to the same level, we have to be able to join the development agenda, and that's why this has to be disaggregated. And even as Dr. Tari brings up the issue of people with disabilities, we have been together with them in this work. And you will realize that people with disabilities fall on both sides. But if you're a woman and you have a disability, you're differently abled, you face dual discrimination. So those are some of the things that we're trying to bring up and so as to bring us back to the issue of inequalities and equities, as Dina had said. Yeah. Thank you very much. One of, this, one of the memories that is in my head, because I got a little upset, because every time I speak about the UN, I tell them, you know, uh, you are actually my employer, uh, because it is my taxes that supports the UN. So uh, is it, I think in 2005, when the government assembled several MPs and took them to Mombasa, how many of us remember that on an awareness session? on MDGs. I really got upset, uh, so I still am. Uh, you know, and the reason why I got upset is that the Millennium Declaration was passed in 2000. The MDGs came about a year or so later, but it wasn't until 2005 that our MPs started thinking about the MDGs and they still needed to be taken to Mombasa to be aware. Not even, no, not even to do anything about it, but to be aware. And for that, they needed to have a beach, and they needed to, and, and all of you know all the details of what happened because you saw it on TV, and we knew who has got tummies and who doesn't. And it just, it just tells you how simplistic we take some of the core issues that are life and death to many of us. And so the question that I'm going to ask you, George, is that I have looked at the report of the Beyond 2015, and the Beyond 2015 says it's not enough to look at the MDGs as goals. We need to look at certain fundamental, uh, what Katrin spoke about and said, transformative issues. And so the Beyond 2015 has mentioned a few things. It says we need to look at equality. It says we need to look at uh, universal human rights. It talks about peace. 
It talks about environmental sustainability. Then it goes further and says that these things must be underpinned by accountability, that must be underpinned by good governance, they must be underpinned by universality. Meaning that unless both the rich and the poor discover that this, these issues are a matter of life and death, we will not move forward. Do you, why did Beyond 2015 and GCAP decide to take this position? Do you think that that is the best position that we need to take in moving forward? Looking at how we have had our suckers in Kenya. Uh, thank you. And uh, going by the case of the MPs, uh, are you not certain today that uh, the club that we have, possibly, as somebody mentioned, one of them last week, possibly over 80% are still not aware, even after taking them to Mombasa. Eh? So that's where we start. You, you know we have a new club, so we have to start all over again, isn't it? Uh, and what about our governors and our county labs? Where are we? And we know that we've gone down to budgeting at um, the county levels. Are we taking the issues that we are talking? You see, we are talking about 15% is not enough of the budget. We need much more. Uh, are we taking these issues in uh, to consideration as we do our um, county budgetary processes, which are going on right now as we talk? We, you see, we talked about the national. That is over. But are we focusing on the county, where the action is? So um, I think going to the question, there are key issues. And uh, those are issues that are close to our hearts, which as um, beyond 2015, which are GCAP, we must continue emphasizing. And it has come across board. Human rights, and not just human rights, but universal human rights must be at the core of uh, whatever goals we come up with. The issue of peace and security, especially in this country. I think we don't need to overemphasize, especially in, in Kenya. We know the disruption that occurred in 2007-2008 the disruption to the extent that the economy was growing at uh, well over 7.1 percent it went down to less than um, 4 percent 3.2 actually so we can see the kind of disruptions and life has never been again we still have idps to date we know how many well we are still on a mobile that time how many missed um airtime 2008 when there was disruption and the airtime was even being sold, you are buying 100, but you are told you pay 200, at 200 bob. You see the kind of disruption. So I think peace and security is not, we must have them, it's not an option. Uh, look also at uh, the expenditures. How much is Kenya spending, for instance, trying to maintain peace at uh, Somalia? We are missing so much even in terms of infrastructure the billions that we are spending just to have peace along our Somalia, the Kenya-Somalia border. So, peace is a must. Environment. We are engaging with some people at the grassroots in Embu, recently. And everybody seems to tell anecdotal evidence that um, uh, we never used to have um, uh, we never used to have uh, malaria that is from the uh, western side of the Mount Kenya, not Embu, but calendar is there. You know, even when you talked about highlight malaria that was not around Mount Kenya, it was around possibly Kirisho area. Um, so, in terms of um, environmental sustainability, I think we do appreciate that we cannot have peace without um, taking care of our natural resources, the forests. We appreciate that we had already started fighting. See what is happening in the Nakuru country. Uh, Lake Nakuru is flooded. What is happening? You, you find these variabilities that come with the distortions um, that go with not taking care of the environment. So, but I'm glad that on Tuesday, Obama, Obama did make a statement. Are we aware of what the statement? His position in terms of global warming, in terms of climate change. You remember Obama's position has been he must take concrete steps. And uh, when Congress was dealing, he said he must take it. And he did that on Tuesday. He said he must take care. He must take leadership in terms of climate change. 
and that is very beautiful. Equality. We must have an equal society. Equality, equity, those are issues, those are principles that we've been seeing as uh, BO 2015, as GCA must be at the core again. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Listen to what it is that, that you have to say. And I, I just want you to give either a brief comment or a statement of what you yourself see in this perspective, especially in relation to gender, because I know that the the post-2015 agenda is fairly broad. But I would want us to look at it in terms of how it affects ourselves, not just in this country, but specifically how it affects our women, how it affects, uh, it affects our sisters, how it affects the girls in general. So I will take a few comments, and then we'll just get a response from there. We're not um, placing enough emphasis on is issues of sexual and gender-based violence that is very prominent, um, that is actually a big barrier um, to very many girls accessing education. So perhaps just mm -hmm. um, a comment or a reaction to those two. My name is Wanja Maina. I'm a student at the USIU. I have um, a comment and a question. First, I'd like to emphasize the issue of engaging men when it comes to issues of women and gender equality. This is because you realize that many of the challenges that women face, for example, sexual-based violence, most of the propag the actors are actually men. So while we are busy talking about women, the biggest actors and the people to talk to are actually our men. Uh, number two, I'd like to, I read bits of the report that was released by the HLP panel, and one thing I noticed is that they treated women as a homogeneous group. Uh, the women are very, very different. For example, the challenges facing a woman in northeastern Kenya are very different from the challenges facing a woman in upmarket Nairobi. Mm -hmm. They are both women, they both have challenges, but the challenges differ depending on the context. I would like also to mention briefly the issues of quotas and affirmative action. Right. We need to review them okay. because they said that 5% has gone down while we still have a lot of women and probably those seats are meant for them. Okay. And lastly, for one second, I'd like to say that we need to find a way of localizing the MDGs in the county government mm. to ensure that the effects are felt at the grassroots. Thank you. Okay. Um, my colleague here has said everything, so my role is very small. I wanted to underscore one point that is forgotten, and that's about child survival. It is important that we are devising women to exclusively breastfeed their babies for the first six months of life. Very noble. But do we have an environment where a working woman, like maybe most of you who are here, can breastfeed her baby and do her job because she needs to earn the living? Are we prepared? Do we have strategies at uh, the policy level to make it friendly for the mother to take her baby to work? Our mothers took us everywhere to church, to, to the garden, to the market, and the baby breastfed. But today, these young women, and I was there sometimes, must leave the baby behind with some baby minder who is themselves a baby. So this needs to be taken care of at a very high level. Otherwise, the child will not survive. And therefore, we are wasting time getting mothers generate them, and they die. Another small point is the rehabilitation of our health facilities. It is important that this is done so that the mother can deliver away from the mental cases to sometimes attack them. So we need a facility that takes care of the maternity wing, makes sure it is next to the casualty so that it's accessible and that it is safe for women because they are vulnerable. I was very keen to look at the issue of quality, equity, and parity in the context of education. Very quickly, the focus is on science education. If you look at our school system, you'll discover that um, most 
of the science teachers are male, and very few are female. And that's point one. Point two, eventually you also find that even in colleges and universities, most of the science-oriented careers are male-dominated. Reason, most girls and women are not taking what we call the SMT subjects. That is science, mathematics, and technological subjects. So my question is, how do we get our women, that is the girls and I mean, the girls and women to be oriented towards the science-oriented um, careers to address the issues of gender equality, parity, and equity? Okay. I know the three words don't need the same thing. My name is Rose Ishure. I am a banker, but transiting to a farmer very soon. And I'm very happy and proud. Um, I'll just ask one question of what I've been encountering. As much as we're doing empowerment for women, we still have so much discrimination, even at work. It's very good that she's raised it up. Um, one reason why I'm transiting and changing careers is that uh, after I gave birth, to my child, and when I came back from my maternity leave, it was really limiting. Like, my employer was frowning on me. I cannot continue to breastfeed my kids. There's no enough facilities where I can go and express milk for my baby. It is really, it's, it's really bad. How can we raise a society which is not healthy and we're expecting it to really perform? My second question is, there's this uh, and it goes to the government. We have the Women Enterprise Fund. I don't know how we do it because I've seen it with my own eyes where I work. I can't disclose which bank. But we have the money, yes. But before a woman is, is able to access that money, we are asking for security in form of land. Seriously? Who does that? They don't have security for heaven. Who does that? I wish I can talk to Kenyatta himself. <laughs> this serious. Which makes women and the children to suffer. They have, they have died so much and they are innocent. Where the, we are, the government is leaving people who are not having jobs to go and rob from them. Where they are killing the women and the children because they are the ones who are, who are unable to run away. The second question is, the community health workers are doing a good job to eradicate mortality rate in the country. They are, but the government does not look on those empty community health workers. They are not motivated, but they do voluntary work yes. to, enable, to make the women not to give back in hospitals so that they can reduce the, the, the child mortality rate. And also the other one which I'm having is concerning the free primary education. We have seen that one. But the children ratio to teacher ratio is so low that the children are more and the, the teachers are less. What can the government, which steps are the government taking in to ensure that they, the, the children are receiving quality education? My name is Felicita Kitonga. I work for FAMNET. Um, my question is, I have seen a lot of um, stakeholders in this post-2015, but there's a major stakeholder who is missing there, the media. And when I'm speaking about the media, I'm not talking about just journalists, I'm talking about chief editors and people who actually own the media. Because the media has become a major key in disseminating information especially in the third world countries where there's also emergency of vernacular radio stations. So I think maybe we can bring the media on board. Uh, I have a question and uh, an observation. I'm looking at the laws. Uh, I think the affirmative action uh, provided in the constitution in Article 53 and uh, you know the entrenchment of uh, the MD, MDGs uh, in the 2010 dispensation you know, as you know, uh, the lawyer from uh, the law, the, the high court said, uh, is uh, a sweet, you know, fragrance of a flower. I want to share those comments. I'm looking at, uh, you know, Article 27 of the Constitution, for instance, that you know provides for the two-third uh, inclusion, you know, of uh, you know both the genders. Uh, looking at that provision, which was you know uh, quashed by 
uh, the Supreme Court, I begin to question, you know, uh, the entrenchment of the MDGs by the Constitution. Is this Constitution at the document that we really think, you know, we really think it is? I believe it is not. Yeah. And uh, what are we supposed to do? Maybe as, you know, uh, uh, the NGOs and the Human Rights Watch, we do something about that. Then the explanation on the, you know, the drop uh, on the women representation uh, to, you know, by about 5%. Does this affirmative action, you know, play to our disadvantage? You know, uh, we have uh, the Constitution in Article 97 and 98, you know, provides for a uh, 47 women presentation and a uh, 16 uh, nomina nomination for, you know, women in the Senate. Does the a political echelon, you know, uh, reserve this position for women and refuse them, you know, the opportunity to competitively, you know, uh, by and, uh, you know, go for these positions. Is this constitution playing against us? Thank you. Uh, I just, uh, from one of the meetings here, I challenge you guys that uh, as individuals, we are leaders. Can we just go out there and start creating the empowerment programs? There are five girls, uh, our young ladies, we sat with uh, from in October last year. We decided just to do one simple thing, to go and register business name which cost only such 100 bob, and then 800 shillings to register it, and you have a certificate, and you have open an account. And they formed five groups, uh, companies. One of them now is called Castrill, is employing 85 uh, girls. If you go to, if in the last three months you've been seeing Daima milk production, and any promotion in supermarkets, the lady is putting on blacks. They're coming from Castrill. The CEO, she's called Angela, and she's only 24 years we came from this kind of setup. So we are trying to come up with another program. Is it possible to add value to what we do so that we don't ask for donors support? So that we make, like, we are thinking of making a million millionaires in the next one year as part of 50 years of Kenyan independence. So let's keep in touch and see if you can make it a reality. Um, I know there's so much to be done in as far as MDGs are concerned, but there's also the new dispensation, which means that everybody has a responsibility to play. Let us not sit back and look at who is doing what, but people must take up the initiative and responsibility to contribute to it. My concern and our focus is gender and gender development. What do you feel when you watch what happened yesterday in the news that somebody was at the hospital and she was raped? What happens when uh, you watch a group of students who are going for drama festivals and then somebody rapes them? What does it make you feel as a man, as a parent, and as a citizen of this country? I think that these are things that, you know, issues of gender are cross-cutting. And if you cannot engage directly, why then don't you make it your corporate social responsibility, you know, as something that you can contribute to in the work, in the life and in the general, um, uh, in, the, in Kenya at large, because you are not safe. Be uh, for me, I know that for as long as there's a rapist teacher, then my daughter, who is getting the best from me, might not be able to realize what she wants to be in life. So what is your take on that? That is my challenge to all of us. Thank you. How do we take this agenda? So that uh, as we look at the post-MDG, we make them realize that the post-MDGs are not about what happens in New York. They are not about what resolutions are made by the UN, but about what happens here. Concerns have been raised about the bargaining power uh, of women. Uh, concerns have been raised very over and over again about the laws that are this themselves not implemented. Issues about responsibility, and uh, the, our last speaker just spoken very passionately about how to change the attitude of men and what men can begin to do, realizing that when you're talking about gender, talking about women, it's really about our own daughters, really about our own sisters. How do we deal with this? And then finally, the comments that are being, are being made is that at the end of the day, is the government commitment real? Because if the government is giving all this money and says publicly we have given this money to women, and then the same women can't access them. 
are we really honest when we are saying that we want the women to move uh, to move forward or are we simply putting things hoping that it will it will it will give us votes in the next elections and then somebody talked about uh, its use of the leadership where is affirmative action really working for us or is it working against us and you've heard about what has ha what is happening in the senate about you you've been given these numbers and then it's all taken away at the other side so in looking at all these issues and i'll begin with you uh, Julian, and then we'll just move on. Uh, what are your responses, and what do you think that we need to take forward in the post-2015 agenda? For me, one thing that is coming out very clearly, even in terms of the laws, the policies, and what we would want, is that we need political accountability and good governance. A very practical example, maybe just to build up on what they have said, is, is um, the Bungoma County budget yesterday, where the, the governor allocated himself how much? 20 million? 50 million on entertainment? Yeah. 53 million on, enter on entertainment. And what Dr. Tari said, we have 30 matatus a day crushing of women who need health care. And that cannot be achieved. So we need to change our priorities. And we can't keep saying we need to. It's us. As a, as a person, in your personal capacity, just talking to the next person and telling them, you know, this should happen. We can't wait for it. It's the same government that doesn't have the political will to move these things. So we have to move things from the ground, taking them up. Saying, no, we cannot have such money going to the county. This is what is happening. We have a more serious issue on, on, on maternal mortality that needs to be addressed. Even if it means going the pig's way, I mean... Something needs to do we need to go the pig's way for us to have a, a post-2015 agenda that looks very, very honestly and critically at the issues of women? Well, <laughs> well, hello. Yes, we oh, can yeah, hear yeah. you. Hello, fortunately, uh, as somebody said, I love pork, especially pork shops. Eh? But, uh, but I think if that must be the way, Surely, we must take that direction because you just talked about leadership. In this country, the bottom line is leadership. Unfortunately, we also say that voters, we only get the leaders we deserve, isn't it? We elect them, we had a chance, we put them in, and then the other thing is that even if we went back today, there is a recall. I know none of governor is being recalled and several others, eh? Looks like governors are uh, much easier to recall. Eh? But are we going to get any better? Because somebody says that you, you only get, you see, from the populace, you get the same kind of fellows, which means there is a morality issue also. Are we any different from those, from those leaders that we have? So I'm saying leadership, even if it means going the pig way, yes, count me in. Because we must keep on engaging our leaders to ensure that they are conscious of the light development steps that must be taken. We must have, for anything to happen in this country, political goodwill is, again, the bottom line. Because try and put up a project tomorrow, somebody comes with his goods and blinks down your investment. You've seen it happen haven't you? So political goodwill is a bottom line. Three, again related to leadership, corruption. We say we lose about that a percent. You see we are talking about uh, 51 billion to uh, the laptops. Eh? Uh, is it laptops or tablets? <laughs> um, okay. mm. But how much do we lose to corruption in this country? We talk about that a percent. Others say it's much higher, possibly as much as double that amount. How much money are we talking about? Then the populace, we talked about responsibility. Do you ever get annoyed? How many people are annoyed here? Be because that is the starting point. We must start <laughs> getting annoyed because to take action and decisive action, you need to get very, very annoyed. It's not only in... Um, our, the issue of maternal health that we have a lot of people going. We've been told about uh, the non-communicable diseases. We have been told very many times 
about road safety. We are in road safety. Motorcyclists, motorcyclists. How many are going to take uh, are going to cycle home today? How many people are dying? Not the rider, but the one, the passenger. And you still take. What action do you take, ladies? I don't. I know you won't. You you don't like the helmet, isn't it? Because they mess up your hair. But surely, what comes first? Is it your safety? Is it your please? Okay, Dina. Uh, the gentleman here gave a very passionate plea, plea and, it, and he told, uh, in a nutshell, what he was telling the women is just go out there and do it. We are behind you, we will support you, and even said, even right now, is willing to give his support uh, if, if, it is, uh, if, it is win if it is needed in terms of getting women ahead. And he says the reason why the situation is the way it is is because the men are the ones leading. If, if, you, if you just listen to the conversations going on, do you feel as feminine that you are leading a futile battle? Or do you get some hope? And in looking at the post-2015 agenda, do you think that it actually provides hope? And if it does, what are the fundamental things that you'll need to, you need to include there? Yeah, thank you. I mean, when you work in the area of gender, sometimes you get excited, sometimes you get frustrated. That's the truth. Because sometimes they think there's progress when you see, you know, many women in, in parliament, when you see many women in, 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 in decision-making positions, in, 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 you know, not just in government, but in private sector and other sectors. But sometimes you see the things that you think really are obvious are not seen as obvious by so many people that you think you've been working with and they should be the same people that should be supporting you. And that can be very frustrating. I'll give an example. During the open working group in the meeting I was in New York, during the closing ceremony, that was after three days of us waking up early in the morning and pushing for our agenda as a women uh, major group. And the issues included, because of talking about employment, so we, it included things like we want equal pay as women, we want uh, rights to property and access to land, we want um, care economy to be taken care of, you know, like we were pushing our issues when it came to the employment, when it came to social protection, we pushed our issues, when it came to health, we pushed our issues, which included sexual reproductive health and rights, and what that means, because we have to articulate that, otherwise they will, <laughs> you know, they will take it the way they want to take it. And then during the closing ceremony, one of the co-chairs, what he said in his closing, the only thing he said about gender was that we have heard that women die while giving birth. Can we afford to continue seeing women die while giving birth, and yet yeah, these are the same women that we want to raise our children. And I was like, okay, yes, Kocheya, yeah. mm -hmm. that's very important, but should that be the only reason why women should live? Because they have to raise our children. They are their <laughs> children. They are men's children. They're not even women's children. So the reason they shouldn't die is that they have to raise their children. For me, that's how I interpreted it. Secondly, should we just look at women as the ro their role is just to give birth? <coughs> or we do more than that? Because we do. And you know, I listened to also my, the presentation of my brother when he, when he reached that point on uh, maternal mortality and he said this is a very big concern for women. It's our big concern, yes, but it's your concern because you are, we are your wives. <laughs> 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 we are your children, we are your mothers. You don't want us to see dying while trying to give birth, you know? So it's a concern of everyone, not just women. And I really like your comments that, you know, you are behind us and we really want you to be behind us. Feminist believes that gender equality can only be attained if men and women believe in it genuinely. Because some people say it and they don't really believe in it. And it's just a lip service. And that's why we have a program on, on men engage. I think you had my colleague, uh, Ken, talking about that. So for me, really, you know, we're interested, we are concerned about maternal mortality, but we're also very concerned and we want to decide how many children we want to give birth to, how we want to space them, whether they want to give birth or not. But we also, we also want to be CEOs of big companies. We also want to be ministers. We also want to be presidents. We want to be governors and non-deputies. Like the case in Kenya, majority of women are just deputies. You know? <laughs> and you keep asking Paul that why is it that we only have 5% in private sector in women, of women? I mean, 
If I asked you why is it that developing, developing countries are still developing countries and they're, they're not developed, would you answer that question? <laughs> it's because of discrimination that continues and attitude that have refused to change. And for me, my closing remark is that we need to change our attitudes and we need to be genuinely for gender equality. And let's not look at gender equality like it's something that is so far away. It's something we live with, it affects us as men, as women. Thank you very much. Innocent, uh, let's, we, you, you began your presentation very well by talking about how the government has become very inclusive. In fact, the constitution right now allows for some law called picketing, uh, meaning we can actually get out of here and go on the streets uh, and we will get, uh, we, and, and the police will not run after us. So listening to these conversations and listening to this, rather than speak from a defensive perspective and say, you know, the government is trying its best, you know, that's always a very nice language. If we really want to help one another and we, we committed to help the government beyond 2015. What do you see as the things that we need to do as citizens to make sure that when the government works on its agenda, uh, agenda post 2015, it will address all this crisis that you've had here? Well, listening to the questions coming from the audience and uh, all the very, 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 very branded uh, questions uh, just get me thinking that perhaps maybe while you are preparing for this forum, you should have expanded uh, the panel. Because uh, when you say the government, you know, actually I may not be very competent to comment on everything. <laughs> That's a very, very valid concern. But uh, nonetheless, uh, back to your question. Uh, right. Yeah, we've, we've had, I started with the consultations that we've, we've been having and uh, Looked, looking at the, the varied uh, places where we held our consultations. And for me, those voices were very important. We took care of them. Uh, and we made sure those, these voices were actually also shared with other, uh, other, other stakeholders at the national level. Also when we met with the CSOs at the national level. And for me, I think uh, that more or less informs the... F because those are the, 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 the voices and the views that the government is going to use to, to inform its position when it's actually forming its position. Because you know the post-2015 network uh, framework is going to be a negotiated uh, framework. Right. So the government is actually going to use those views. And I don't know if there's no, uh, b b of course, there's a, I don't know if there's any, a better way of uh, getting those voices heard. But once uh, the framework has been uh, formulated and it's back to the country now to actually ensure its achievement, then again, it depends on what the framework is. I think there'll be very many, many big roles for all the players, the private sector, the, the, non, the civil society, and also, and also the government. And now coming back to some of the issues that you've raised, I will start with one issue which I will not let to go past, okay. the issue of uh, the MPs. You said that you are annoyed. Actually, I come from the unit that uh, organized for this sensitization. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it's, 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 it, it, I may appreciate your view, but one thing you may want to know is that, uh, in the, in the, in the, for instance, we, we have people who, there's a lot of funds, for instance, in the, uh, the world funds. We had CDF, we had LATIF. Uh, the people who are actually in control, who have people who have a lot of influence in how that uh, money can be invested, actually the MPs, the, we talk about the chief officers and the, and the civic leaders at the local authorities. If you cannot drop in these people to buy into the whole idea of the MDGs, I don't know if you can expect them to also uh, lead their budgeting processes in a way that is uh, responsive to the needs of the MDGs. So. Those, that was a particular concern, and I don't know if you may have uh, listened to, maybe you're not very keen because you are angry, but, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but uh, th there's been a lot, of, uh, a, a, lo a lot of reference to MDGs from that. You would even hear members of parliament talking about MDGs much more often, and they even went ahead mm. to form a parliamentary caucus. I think the, the concern probably that comes about was not so much about the fact that the MPs need to know, and sorry I'm pinning you on this, but the fact that it took five years from the time that the Millennium Declaration was started mm. to the time that the government realized that actually we needed the MPs or whatever to be engaged in this. Okay, okay, that's, that's still a valid point. <laughs> now, we had 15 years of MDGs, yeah? 
divide this into three trimesters. Okay. Okay. The first one is the year 2000 to the year 2005. And then we've got 2005 to the year 2010. Mm -hmm. When the MDGs began, and I'm sure most of you in the civil society, many people actually thought this to be more of the UN, UN ideology. So it took a lot of time. I would say five years. Almost five years were not trying to debate, but they were initially accepted. So I don't think it is any exception. It's actually all over the world. Okay. And the process right now being more inclusive will actually avoid this. Probably if we engage uh, leaders at another level, it would actually be bringing them to, 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 to speed on, on the processes that they have, and not, not, not on the MDGs per se. Okay. And talking about localization, I think we did a lot of that also in the first years. We tried all the avenues. We used the vernacular radios. We used even even we tried to segment everywhere. We were the, even in Nairobi. You had Eve D'Souza. She became a champion because she they didn't need any of us in the at Capital FM studios. She would actually talk about the issues and engage the youth on on, on these issues. Mm -hmm. And then when you're talking about the commitment, I think it's good to look at the budget, for instance, because the current uh, the budget that was just read this month. Eh, you look at, for instance, in health, in terms of improving quality access to healthcare. You know, quality is a very wide word. But you know, the things you, that you may want to look at are maybe the quality of infrastructure, the the ratio. You may also want to look at maybe the staff versus patients. And you could see there's already a big attempt to have at least 30 new nurses employed in every constituency. I know you may debate it in one way or another, but these are very big signs of commitment. Okay, yes. okay, thank you very much. Finishing. And uh, in okay. terms of the media, Sorry. in terms of the media, I would say they're already on board, because if you've been following, I, if, if you've had a lot of interest in the MDGs, you may have noted a change of tune, or rather a change of tune. The way the, the media, media houses actually handle development issues is much more different right now. You'll find, I don't want to name media houses because if I name one and I don't name another one, then that's being unfair. But if you look across, you'll actually find that you'll, you'll even get a media house dedicating up to 15 minutes unpaid time just to talk about maybe a key development issues like maternal health. And uh, whenever we have any functions, uh, in the previous uh, days, we used to have, the, the media will come, but they will only report about maybe what the politician who was there said. But nowadays, it's very different. We had a session, when we had the national uh, CSO consultation, there was coverage across all the media houses, and it was not the fillers. These were actually real stories, and you could see they took a lot of time to come up with those stories. So they're already on board. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, finally, fellow Jane, the, the issue of equity is still coming across very, very strongly, and somebody mentioned it very in science. The fact that women are in fact self-discriminating which is in the process again works against them. So ultimately, as we are pointing fingers, what can we do? What is, what, what is the expectation of what the women would do? Because it's, we can throw it on the other side, uh, but when it comes back to us, the 2015 agenda, what can we do as women? And for you, who is going to be a mother very soon? I think the fact that they say women are self-discriminatory is a myth, first of all. So I believe that women, we support each other. And that's why we are saying that we have so much support now that we, now we are even going to ask the men to back us up. Because <laughs> we feel we have a consolidated group as it is. And so um, going forward, I just want to say three things. The next steps, because our country, as my colleague has said, uh, the post-2015 development framework is a platform to gather aspirations and visions of citizens. And so these are not aspirations of people in Mars or people in, 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 in some other country. They are our aspirations. Same as the Constitution. And now is not the time to now rest, because I know we did a lot of work to get that constitution. So people feel like now people are resting, now that we have this great constitution. But now is the time to be vigilant. Now is the time to be actively engaged in this process. Like he says, wanawake mutokeze. You know, we'll wait for you. Now is the time to be actively engaged. And most importantly, like all of us have noted, we have to own this process. Because this is, these are our aspirations. My neighbor's aspirations, that's why we are doing consultations. So that these things don't become paper tigers where they are excellent documents and yet we are not seeing the results. It starts from me and you. 
And so that's why we have to popularize and try and localize this agenda as much as possible. In moving forward, you are the people who are engaged in this process. You are the one who are mobilizing uh, citizens. You are the one who are engaged at the global process. What do you think are the two things that you will do from here? to make sure that the post-2015 agenda changes the course of women. Just two things that you want to do after this conversation. For me, the, one th the first one thing will be community engagement, ensuring that the community from Mashinani is aware of the process and their views are heard. Um, my second one thing would also be towards awareness creation. That is um, ensuring that the media has priorities. Uh, lately, I feel that the media the priorities of the media are a bit misplaced in terms of the things that they are giving priority and the development issues that should be given priority appear in the middle of the newspaper well issues or, or towards the end of the news while well issues that should be given more priority are not. Thank you. Okay, George. Uh, thank you. Possibly two things. two things. Yes. The first one good governance. I think governance uh, is key and it has kept on coming back. I know it has been there before. Uh, and then two, ensuring that the voices of the people are not lost between Nairobi and New York. How are we going to do that as Jacob? Well, we continue ensuring, having a look at um, the documents that the government is preparing. Because by the end of the day, the government and the civil society we've all engaged, but by the end of the day, we've talked about commitment of the government. By the end of the day, New York and the new goals, we are talking about commitments by the government for a start. Okay. So we'd like to ensure that the government, the Kenya government is committed to the voices of the Kenyan people, which means takes those ahead and lobbies for them to be included okay. in the international agenda. Okay. Dina, what are the two things that Feminet is going to do uh, after having listened to all these comments? Okay. Uh, thank you. For me, this discussion has just uh, reaffirmed things that we have been already hearing uh, from different uh, constituencies of women. And that's that we need a transformational approach. If you're talking about post 2015 women, we need to stop doing business as usual. You know, we're not going to continue uh, depending on policies that have failed and approaches that have failed. So how can we have a development approach that measure, that actually has target of improved well-being as the major target? Mm -hmm. For me, I want to see a development framework that will say, is this woman's well-being improved? If a woman is not able to breastfeed her child, her well-being has not improved. You know, if a woman is still beaten, her well-being has not improved. If she still walks on the street and gets raped, her well-being has not improved and you have not achieved any development. Okay. So how does development work for women? And let's not stop just talking about how women should work for development, but how does development work for women? Mm -hmm. And so transformation approach is very important, but also political will. Because many times we have these good documents, and I don't know how our government sign on to them, but they do. And then when it comes to implementation, it's never there. So mm. political will is very important. And we will do that through mobilizing our constituencies, which is our member across Africa. Thank you very much. Uh Innocent. What, 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 what do you, what, what do you think you need uh, making, to move making as a government? Making yeah. commitments is an unfamiliar territory for me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what I will say is, uh, uh, with the, 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 the consultations that we've had, eh, we'll make sure all the voices are kept. Are those consultations consultation still open? In other words, the team that is well, here, they can they still bring their comments? Well, uh, the, well we, the structured processes are over, but I think if you want to make uh, any, 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 any contribution, mm. you could probably, the, the structured national consultations, because you know it's yes. still, a no, and, and as you heard from the presentations, even after the UN General Assembly, it's not going to be over. Right. Because the framework is going to come probably as we close the, the, the cut and draws on the year 2015. Okay, the second yeah. commitment? 
Pardon? The second commitment. I said uh, making commitments <laughs> is an unfamiliar territory. The second me. proposal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I would like to thank you for your participation okay. and for inviting me. Thank you. Okay, that's a commitment of sorts. I said, okay. Uh, fellow Jin, you've got the last word. What do you think all of us, now just looking just beyond just fem, uh, beyond feminine, just looking at all of us and looking at civil society and looking at government, what do we need to do moving forward to make the post-2015 agenda transformative for, for women? many terms of process and outcome of course after hearing innocent speak the first uh, next step will be to hold him accountable <laughs> now that we've all heard what he said and then uh, secondly is to just demand for a bold framework once we get the framework the people have to own it otherwise it will not make sense what we are doing this whole process since last year going to New York the $2,000 US, US dollar flights they would make sense if the people cannot own the process so that's my next I think that's what we should all be involved in the next step Okay, and neither will this discussion make any sense if we don't take any actions. We can come to these forums and talk about all the things that we want to do, but the government will go on, the post-2015 agenda will continue, and the process will go on, and we will wait to complain later on how we were not involved. The government has told you the space, the civil society that are sitting here have told you that they're willing to carry a voice. The men have told the women that they're ready to support them. Now the challenge is back to you. Thank you very much. And allow me to invite Katrin to come and uh, close the session for now. But let's appreciate the panelists uh, for the very, very, very engaging time. Very short time. The notice was very short. We really appreciate all of you. And then let's appreciate ourselves for the very, for the patience we have. It's well, well past time, and we really thank you all for the work you've done. Okay, Julian, you're coming to close? Okay, thank you. Okay, let's give him a, a hand clap as well, please. Mr. Paul Okumu, thank you very much. Our panel members, uh, on short notice, you were able to use this space just before the process closes for government. If there's any two things you can take back, I think we'll appreciate. I don't want to add one word, basically just to say personalize MDGs, personalize them. Then you know where to engage and where to fit into these processes. Um, so allow us to close and uh, as Anteni Sana we will be I think um, dialoguing again uh, next month in uh, July at the last Thursday of the month. Welcome here again. Thank you. Bye-bye.